Hello and welcome to another lecture uh, on integrity on uh, construction safety. Today we're going to talk about concrete and masonry safety. This is a long lecture, so we're going to divide it into two parts. One part is going to talk about concrete and the other part is going to talk about uh, masonry. So what do we need to know about concrete and masonry? A lot of activities take place in concrete and masonry construction, and these can be very hazardous if, if uh, attention and care are not uh, taken into consideration. So what are some of the most frequently cited serious violations? Failure to protect employees from impalement, which is basically rebar not being capped or covered, as we're going to talk about it in a minute. Failure to establish a limited access zone to limit the number of workers in the danger zone where a masonry wall is under construction. We're going to talk about what's a limited access zone. Failure to brace unsupported section of masonry wall over 8 feet in height. When the wall is still under construction, it's not strong enough yet. So if it's not properly supported, it can collapse with strong wind or heavy equipment passing next to it and so on. Failure to have drawings or plans at the job site to indicate jack layout and formwork placement, especially for certain types of concrete operations that require a lot of coordination as we're going to see on, on the next slides. So the first uh, issue is uh, protection from impalement. Impalement basically is when something sharp uh, can penetrate uh, the body of a worker. So what are some effective control measures that can be used to guard rebar so employees cannot fall into or onto the rebar and become impaled? We can either uh, prevent the employees from working in an area where they may fall into or onto unprotected rebar. In some cases that's not the easiest solution, so we have to look for other solutions as well. So if this is not possible, use guardrails or other fall protection measures as outlined, as we're going to discuss later in subpart M that deals with fall protection. And third, with that second option available, we're going to rebar. The rebar is going to be capped with special protective uh, rebar covers, as you can see in the picture, to keep employees from being impaled we do not use plastic or paper cups or tape as rebar cover as a rebar cover because they do not protect workers from impalement. So it has to be sturdy enough according to specifications to prevent even if someone falls on top of it, it would not uh, be broken or torn and allow for impalement as well. The rebar also can be bent, but only when an engineer has approved this practice or the rebar can be covered with lumber. So if you have multiple bars next to each other, you can extend a two by four uh, board, for example, on top of them, and that would prevent the hazard of impalement. Here, as we can see, uh, the mushroom cap, which is the one that shows here in this uh, picture, this is not allowed because it's ineffective. The square cap with reinforced uh, uh, base here at the top is the one that's accepted, and that's the one that's effective. So here on the next picture, we're going to see examples of that. So here, for example, we can see that the rebar here is capped with uh, concrete, small concrete blocks. Here you can have also a two by four. Here we have these mushroom caps in some cases, again, as we mentioned, unless they are uh, reinforced, they're not gonna be allowed. Here we have a clear violation because you have an opening and it, it's not showing whether they're capped or not. So I guess they're not capped. That's an impalement hazard. So this is a violation. Here we have the rebar has been bent, again following instructions from the structural engineer. And here we have either caps or the 2x4 covering the rebar. So both of these are acceptable options. Another hazard that comes with construction uh, of concrete work is when we have uh, uh, post-tensioning work for pre-stressed concrete, basically for the pre-stressed concrete, you induce stresses in the concrete tendons, which are the rebar, but concrete tendons tend to have stress into them. So when you load the concrete element, it counterbalances these stresses, yielding a smaller size and lighter in weight concrete uh, element. So for post-tensioning work, the following precautions have to be followed. Access shall be limited behind the jack to those performing the work. The jack is going to be used to tension these tendons. Signs and barricades are required to limit access as well, so that people who are not, who should not be working in this area are not going to be performing any work. So on this slide, on the picture here, we can see 
that these are the tendons and here they are capped and here's the jack tensioning these uh, tensioning these uh, tendons so again we're going to try to limit access within this area to only people who have to be there a third hazardous area when it comes to concrete is concrete placing we have multiple ways of concrete placing whether it's through a pump whether it's through buggies whether it's through a uh, tower crane and buckets so here we're going to talk about tower cranes and buckets employees are not allowed to work under concrete buckets being lowered or elevated into position because just in case something goes wrong with the bucket itself and it opens concrete dropping from that bucket can kill someone if someone's standing underneath it and as much as practical buckets should be routed to minimize the number of employees exposed to overhead buckets so in the design of the operation itself we're going to take that into consideration with the motion of the tower crane and of the buckets here on this picture it shows multiple people standing next to a concrete bucket no one standing underneath it they opened the chute for that bucket and we can see concrete flowing out of the bucket to the place where it's where it's supposed to be another area of hazard also is with concrete mixers with capacity greater than one cubic yard they must have a mechanical device to clear the skip of materials so that no one would be tempted to go inside and try to clean that skip guard rails should be used on each should be on each side of the skip again preventing anyone from falling in compressed air hoses on concrete pumping systems must have fail safe connectors because again compressed air at a very strong force can uh, can cause injuries masonry saws must have semi-circular guard enclosure if you remember when we talked about theories of accident causation we mentioned that improper use of equipment this is one of the common ones people sometimes uh, remove the guard thinking that's going to expedite the operation but that again that's a violation by itself do not remove that guard because it has a protective role and function so here we have the guard rails so that no one can fall and here we have the guard enclosure around that saw Concrete buggies, again, if you are, if someone's pushing that buggy and they trip, they may be impaled by the impact with the handles of the buggy. So concrete buggy handles cannot extend past wheels on either side to prevent that impalement and prevent anyone working around again by being affected by it. Concrete pump hoses must have connectors to prevent separation under load, because again, you may risk having the concrete fall under pressure from that hose and concrete buckets with hydraulic release must have a device to prevent accidental dumping and that's why basically we do not allow people to stand underneath a concrete bucket while it's being lifted or lowered power concrete trowels must have dead man switch so basically as long as they are held by the laborer by the employee who's pushing it they are in operation as soon as they release their handle from uh, from that switch it stops automatically so if someone trips again the blades of that concrete trowel would not cause any uh, injuries here what we have is a uh, bull float which has a long handle now the problem here is that we're working close to power lines and and power equipment which can cause a hazard of electrocution so the bull float handles must be non-conductive if electrical contact is possible so it can be of a non-conductive material whether wood or fiberglass or something like that okay so this is basically talking in brief about some of the hazards that can come with concrete operations what about some hazards that can come can come with uh, masonry construction operations as well so here we're going to talk about the major one which is wall collapses especially when the wall is still under construction as we mentioned the the uh, the mortar has not set yet so the the wall has not gained its permanent strength yet therefore it needs to be uh, supported or protected from collapse what are some of the effective control measures that can be used to eliminate the hazard of being in danger in the danger zone to protect employees from being struck by flying brick or block in the event of a wall collapse so until the wall has gained sufficient strength 
that overturning is no longer a hazard. Overturning, again, which is so sort of a collapse due to strong wind or uh, vibration around it. Keep employees out of the area where the wall is being constructed unless they are actually engaged in constructing the wall. Of course, if they are engaged in constructing the wall, they have to be in close pro proximity to it. But if once the wall is complete, until it gains its strength, then no one should be close to it, uh, working close to it. The most effective control measure is to follow the standard by marking off an area with tape, rope, or chain, or any other material that will indicate to employees that they are not to enter that zone or area that has been marked. This is what we call limited access zone. In this case, only the masons who are working on constructing that wall are going to be allowed in this area. Out of that marked area, uh, people can work, but inside it, only the masonry crew that's working on constructing this wall. The zone should be equal to the length of the wall under construction and extend out a distance equal to the height of the wall to be constructed plus four feet. Because again, if it collapses, debris is going to fly everywhere. So you're adding four feet of buffer zone beyond the height of the wall. So if the wall, for example, is eight feet, then that horizontal extent is going to be 12 feet. If the wall to be constructed is 10 feet high and 30 feet long, the zone is going to be 14 feet by 30 feet, which is the length of the wall. If a wall is over eight feet in height, what are some of the ways to brace wa a wall over eight feet to provide protection against the hazard of collapse? The project engineer or competent person should determine how best to brace the wall. According to the magazine of masonry construction, a typical masonry wall brace includes a vertical member, an inclined strut, stakes, and if necessary, a strut brace. We're going to see a picture that uh, illustrates this concept. What kind of material is going to be used for this support? Scaffold planks, two by tens, are typically used as the vertical member and the inclined strut, and two by fours for stakes and strut braces. Two by fours and two by sixes are considered by most experts to be inadequate for vertical member or inclined struts. That's why we're using the uh, scaffold planks, all lumber must be in serviceable condition. So it must be in good condition, not rotting or not su suffering from any uh, damage. The American National Standards Institute, which is called ANSI, uh, has a standard for concrete and masonry work, which is ANSI A10.9, 1983, recommends that the support for bracing, the support or bracing shall be designed by or under the supervision of a qualified person to withstand a minimum of 15 pounds per square foot. Remember that number, 15 pounds per square foot. Local environmental conditions, such as strong wind, for example, need to be considered in determining the bracing design. Braces or shores should be secured in position to prevent them from moving, thus losing this, their effectiveness. If you're gonna be placing concrete inside that wall, in this case, tremis, which is the hose that's going to be used to convey that concrete, must be secured with wire rope or equivalent to prevent them from moving. And again, concrete might uh, start spreading around. Lockout and peg out is required for work on equipment used for concrete and masonry. If they are defective, they need to be locked out or pegged out so no one would use them until they are being properly maintained or repaired. So here we have the picture of a, a tremi that's being used to convey the concrete. In this case, we are using a conveyor belt to drive the concrete to the place, and then it falls through the tremi to try to minimize uh, the scattering and, and sputtering of concrete all around. For cast in place concrete, which is also called concrete uh, cast in situ, formwork must be designed, fabricated, erected, supported, braced, and maintained so that it will be capable of supporting without failure all vertical and lateral loads. That's why, for example, we have a code for not removing the formwork until a certain number of days have passed after placing the concrete. It's determined by the quality of the concrete, by the weather, by the span, by the design, and so on. Several factors involved in the duration before we can remove the formwork. Drawings or plans and any revisions for jack layout, formwork, etc., must be available at the job site especially if we have certain types of concrete being placed, 
like slip form, for example, or uh, lift slab. We're going to talk about that in a moment. We must also include formwork scaffolding and any shoring equipment in these drawings. So they have to show the spacing, for example, between the different elements of the scaffold and the props and so on. To give you an example of uh, how hazardous this operation can be, there's a very famous uh, sad accident in Willow Island in West Virginia on April 1978. 51 workers were killed in the collapse of scaffolding used to pour concrete for a cooling tower under construction. 45 workers fell more than 150 feet and six were crushed to death on the ground. So basically we're talking about the scaffolding itself collapsed there was the weight of the concrete, there was the weight of the people on top of it, the weight of rebar, it could not support all of that weight. So there's the static weight of the formwork and the rebar and the dynamic load by the people walking on top of it and the dynamic load of the concrete being placed. All of that resulted in the collapse of the formwork and as you can see, a very large number of people uh, lost their lives. Here we can see, for example, an example of shoring. Shoring is to be inspected prior to erection, before and after and during concrete placement to make sure that it's still in a good condition supporting the load of the concrete placed on top of it. Reshoring also needs to be inspected. So after you remove the formwork, the bulk of the formwork and you keep a few props, these have to be inspected on a regular basis to make sure that they're doing their job. Uh, these are the concrete, that's a picture of samples of concrete taken into cylinders that's going to be tested on a regular basis, as you remember from your uh, materials class. It's going to be tested after seven days and it's going to be tested again after 28 days to determine whether this concrete complies with the expected compressive strength or not. So uh, that's why a random sample is going to be taken every certain number of cubic yards of concrete to be placed. We're going to take a sample and they're going to be kept in good conditions according to the standards until they are tested again, whether after seven days or after 28 days. When you are placing concrete on site, damage shoring is not to be used because again, it loses its efficiency and effectiveness and therefore it should not be used. Shoring that's found to be damaged must be immediately reinforced. The sills for shoring must be sound, rigid, and capable to carry the maximum intended load. The sills are going to be used to distribute the load. Instead of being a point load, it's going to be a larger area load. Just the same idea of a footing underneath a column, for example. All base plates, shore heads, extension devices, and adjustment screws must be in firm contact with the foundation and the form and secured when necessary to make sure that they do not move from place under the pressure of the concrete on top of them. In case you have eccentric loading, which means it's not axial loading on top of the prop, in, on top of the, the shore head, eccentric loads on shore heads are not allowed unless designed for this because this creates, in addition of the load itself, it creates a moment which may overturn uh, that uh, shore head. It means loads not centered on the head. Lateral loads can cause failures because of that, unless the, the shoring is properly designed to take these lateral loads. So for example, here on this slide, we can see that we have some lateral loads from this, uh, this cantilever. So that's why we have these diagonal or these slanted uh, shoring as additional support for the formwork. Also with cast-in-place concrete, whenever single post, shore, post shores are tiered, which means if you have, for example, the, the floor height is 12 feet and you have only eight foot long shores and they're gonna be tiered, which, are, which means they're gonna be uh, uh, spliced. Additional requirements to be followed are that the shores must be designed and inspected by a qualified person, vertically aligned, properly aligned, spliced to prevent misalignment, and braced in two directions at splice levels and in each tier. So all of these are precautions so that they do not collapse or deform. 
Shoring and reshoring are not to be removed until concrete strength is sufficient to support its weight and any other imposed loads. As we mentioned before, that's going to be dictated by code. The code is going to tell you exactly how long it should take before removing the formwork. Because if you remove it too soon, even if the concrete does not collapse, it might sag and cause permanent deformation in the structure, which can lead to weakness later on leading to collapse. Adjustment of single post shoring not to be made after placement of concrete because again you are now changing the load distribution. Reshoring to be erected as original shoring is removed as needed for support. So after a certain number of days, we're going to have less demand on the number of shores that we have. So we're going to start removing them gradually. And these shores are going to be recycled or, remo or, or reused for uh, a different uh, floor on top of the one we're working on. Formwork stripping, which is removing the formwork after the concrete has been placed, has to be an organized and coordinated operation. What we can see on this slide, although it's a, it appears as if it were a collapse, this was supposed to be properly synchronized and designed, but it seems that at least one uh, shore, one prop was removed too soon, which resulted in the collapse of the formwork on two separate floors. That should not happen because the falling debris can injure and uh, or maybe even kill people. Although the concrete itself is safe, but again, the removal of the formwork in this case was the problem. And here we have the use of a spotter and we have a restricted access area because of the falling debris. Again, we don't want it to cause any injuries to anyone. Slip forms. I don't know how familiar you are with slip forms, but for example, if you have seen the construction of an elevated water tank or the um, a core of a uh, high-rise building, a concrete core of a high-rise building, usually the method that we use for that is what's called a slip form, which means the form is going to be on both sides of the wall and it's going to be jacked up very gradually, very slowly, while concrete is being placed at a certain rate that allows concrete to strengthen while the forms are being lifted up. So scaffolds or work platforms are required for slip forms. Design must be ad adequate and self safe rate of lifting must not be exceeded. That rate of lifting is going to be really slow. It's going to be a few inches an hour maybe. So to allow concrete to gain enough strength before you remove that formwork. So that synchronization has to be studied and properly calculated. Another hazard in concrete comes with the reinforcing steel. Before we have talked about the vertical rebar and the hazard of impalement, and we talked about how to cover the rebar. We also have the horizontal rebar that's used for slabs, for example. Rolls of reinforcing wire shall be anchored to prevent recoiling because if they come in rolls, they have already gained that shape of a cylinder. So if we try to, to straighten them, they would tend to recoil again if they're not properly anchored. Sometimes this rebar would come in sheets, uh, not in, in, um, in coils, and in this case it's going to be much easier to install. Reinforcing steel for walls, columns, etc. should be adequately supported to prevent overturning because again, if it overturns, first of all, it can injure someone, and second, if you place the concrete without the rebar, then it's not a reinforced concrete wall and can lead to a collapse. Another hazard of dealing with concrete is the long exposure to concrete itself, its effect on the skin, which, is, which can cause a skin disease called dermatitis. So contacting dermatitis from concrete exposure can cause severe burns to skin and eyes. Therefore, we're talking about gloves, we're talking about boots, and preferably long sleeve shirts and long, long uh, pants, not shorts, definitely to cover as much skin as we can have and try to eliminate any uh, unnecessary exposure to concrete. So the best practice is employees should wear full length trousers, long sleeve shirts, rubber boots and gloves to avoid prolonged contact with concrete. Not mandatory, but this is a good practice. So if you are a safety supervisor or if you are a field engineer responsible for any concrete work, try to follow this best practice. Also, employees exposed to concrete splatter should wear eye protection because that can hurt the eyes. And in case of an injury from 
particles from concrete while pouring or placing it. Washing fac facilities and eye wash solution should be provided. Again, this is not mandatory, but definitely this is good practice. And as we mentioned before, you care about your employees, you want them to be safe. So we're going to follow that best practice. Let's uh, pause here and then we're going to resume this uh, presentation in another video file.